can appreciate more the beauty that exists, and they can add to it. Man acts on the basis of his deepest convictions. Truth is what we all seek in nature, the classroom, the laboratory, and outer space. Man's first task is to know himself. His mind is his laboratory, logic and reason are his tools. Rampart College has concentrated its search for truth in the areas related to human action. Here to discuss an approach to truth is Mr. Robert Lefebvre, president of Rampart College. You see, what we really have to contend with here is that many people are tremendously concerned with human behavior. Now, we don't always talk about it that way, but most of the time, we're concerned about the behavior of others. We watch other people, we see what they do, and sometimes we approve of what they do, but many times we don't. And uh, I think we spend a great deal of our time uh, during our lives talking about and discussing what other people do, and then more than that, we spend a great deal of our time trying to correct them and see that they don't do what we don't want them to do or that they do what we would like to have them do. And in order to facilitate that type of thing, we end up passing laws to regulate human behavior. Now, I'm not at all certain that that is the best way for us to get along with each other because I think what happens by this process is that we tend to uh, sit in judgment on the personal habits and personal behavior of other people, rather than learning to examine our own behavior and see just what we are doing that is right or wrong. If we are going to have a situation in which we can maximize human well-being, and after all, that would be the purpose of of any study would be for the purpose of benefiting human life, I think perhaps the best course of action would be to begin with ourselves and try to uh, make things better by self-improvement rather than trying to impose our ideas on other people. You see, what we're really getting at is something called freedom. We all speak about freedom. It's a good word. But when we think about freedom, we don't all think the same thing or mean the same thing. What we want, and I think this would be true for each one of us, we want to be free individually to live our own lives, to make our own way, and to succeed or fail on the strength of our own energies and abilities. But then we get to watching other people, and they may not do exactly what we would like, and so instead of governing ourselves, we try to impose on them. Now, it is obviously true that when one man begins to impose on another, that is, he commits an act of molestation against the person or property of another person, well, this is something that does concern us because we don't want things like that to happen to us, and consequently, it wouldn't be good if they happened to anyone. However, we tend to impose our opinions on other people in very personal things, where they have uh, personal habits, personal beliefs, ways of conducting their affairs, and we become prohibitionists, and we decide we can uh, legislate their morals and their private behavior, and when we do this, of course, we get into difficulty. The real question, I think what it comes down to, is the question of morality. Now, that's a, a tricky word. When I say morality with some of my students, why they, uh, they, they don't like it because they think that I'm invoking uh, certain ideas which I don't intend to invoke at all. You know what morality really is? It's a concept that tells us how we ought to behave and how we would like other people to behave. In a sense, it's kind of related to wishing. It's how we wish other people would behave and how other people, I suppose, would wish us to behave. In this area of morality, what we really need to do 
is to find a scientific base from which to reason so that we could come up with a kind of behavior that would be acceptable not on religious grounds necessarily, nor on uh, any other kind of grounds except a kind of scientific ground where we could get to the reality and work from there. So that's, I think, a, a very important idea and one that we could spend a little time on uh, profitably. You see, when we talk about freedom, we mean the opportunity of the individual to choose and to act upon his choices in a real world. You and I are real, and we live in a real world. In fact, in order to deal with the reality that we try to deal with in life, we divide the nature of the things that we do and the nature of the things that we act upon into different orders. And we speak of an objective order. The objective order is the order of reality. That is, everything that exists in itself is objective. It exists in fact. Then there is a subjective order. The subjective order is in essence a reflection of the objective and it explains or it describes the nature of the use of the brain, the way we use our minds. In other words, we deal with objective reality by absorbing images in our mind, and in actual fact, we deal with the images because we cannot absor absorb uh, objective reality in our minds directly. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, I can look at you but I cannot absorb you into my mind. I only absorb the image I have of you into my mind, and I must deal with that image because I cannot get reality of you in my mind. So that is what I have to do, and this is the subjective world. Now, when we put the objective and the subjective together accurately enough, we come up with a third order, which could be the order of knowledge. That is to say, we would know the objective through a subjective process accurately enough so that we could predict how to behave accurately and properly in terms of reality. And actually, any kind of moral behavior should be predicated upon knowledge, upon the nature of things as they are. Now, that's really what it's all about. Let me go to this next chart to illustrate more clearly what I mean. When we are born, we come into this world, and the world is filled with facts. We put all these different lines down here to indicate a vast array of facts. Now, each of those facts is an item in the objective world. The first thing that we do is we perceive these things. And the interesting thing is that we don't perceive everything. That's why we've drawn some lines down and left the others at the top. The ones that we draw down are the things that we perceive, we become aware of. Then we go into a process of identification and classification and selection, and we do these things so rapidly, in fact, that they almost seem to occur simultaneously. As we perceive something, we tend to identify it, then we classify it in terms of other things similar to it, and finally, we select. And the interesting thing is that by the time we get down this far, we've only selected a limited number of items from the vast array that is available at the outset. Having made that selection, then we associate the things that we have selected, we draw them together, as you can see by these horizontal lines. We bring them together. Having made this association in our minds, we formulate an opinion. That is to say, we reach a tentative conclusion about what these things mean. Having done that, we develop an attitude or a belief as to the nature of what this really means to us. And from that, we take action. If our action is based 
on an accurate pulling down of the facts, a proper association of the facts, and the formulation of an opinion that is predicated upon the reality that we're dealing with to begin with, then the chances are very good that we'll get the kind of action that we want. In thinking and talking about scientific morality, what we really have to get to is the concept of a principle. I mentioned this matter of objective reality, and probably most of us think of objective reality as being those things that exist in nature that have uh, three dimensions and we can handle, touch, and uh, locate by our physical senses. A principle uh, is also a factor in the objective order. A principle is simply a, a discovery that human beings make as to how certain things work depending on their nature. And what we've been trying to do for many years and haven't done very well is to come up with principles relating to human behavior so we would know what kind of behavior really should occur on the basis of the nature of man as it is. Well, we may have come up with a little principle here, and let me explain why I think that's possible. Uh, when we are dealing with a principle, or when we're trying to find one, what we try to do is to isolate a certain limited number of factors, put them together under controlled conditions, and then come up with a predictable result. Uh, if we can always predict the result from the same factors that are put together in the same way each time, then we have a principle. If it varies, then we perhaps have only a probability. If it varies pretty widely, <laughs> it's only a possibility. But when we're dealing with a principle, it has to be predictable 100% of the time in relation to the factors that are being examined. I think we can find such a principle in human behavior. It would come to this thought. It is predictable that no human being in the world will ever approve of his own molestation. I don't think there will be any variation to that. We may approve of molestation if it relates to someone else, but if we control the circumstances and conditions and we talk about molestation, I think it is true that no one of us will ever willingly be the victim of an act of molestation committed against us by someone else, irrespective of the reason. We simply don't want other people molesting us. It is predictable then, insofar as human action and human reaction is concerned, that if I molest you, you won't like it. And I can predict the, your displeasure. And if you act against me, uh, you can predict the same thing. I'll guarantee it. I don't want to be molested either. Uh, I'm using molestation here now as a general term relating to the violation of the will of a person in respect to something over which he has dominion, his person or something else that is his. Now, to actually put this into a working framework of reference, what I would like to do is to show you what I think lies at the base of any degree of moral understanding. And that would be the property concept, because as I examine it, I think this is the base of the whole thing. We have learned how to get along with each other down through the ages by learning the nature of property and more specifically the nature of property ownership. Now that's a very interesting thing. In the early days when the idea of property was first being uh, discussed and brought out, many people used the word property to mean both the item owned and the fact or the action of owning. But I'd like to divide them and specify that something that is owned is the item of property, and the act or the relationship between the owner and the item owned is ownership, and it's something else entirely. In other words, uh, one is an action that we take, a relationship that we establish, and the other thing is the property itself or the or the object with which the relationship is established, so that we are talking about two different things. In order to explain this uh, so that we uh, uh, really get the significance out of it, we have devised a series of symbols that we use, 
and uh, I'd like to direct your attention here. We use